Have you ever wondered what happens behind the scenes of a startup? Join me and my CEO, Keith, as we take you on a journey from private conversations to public sharing of our launch planning, product roadmap, and customer discussions. This is Launch and Learn, building in public. So now that we're at like uh, sort of business as usual after the whole uh, uh, Silicon Valley bank gate that we discussed last week, um, uh, what, um, what's been going on in the conversations you've been having with, with, uh, with folks, with customers, with potential customers around, you know, some of the, uh, revenue teams and, and kind of the, the zeitgeist of, of how things are happening. In yeah. The, you know, in kind of, space. uh, interestingly in our last conversation, we talked about this idea of expansion, qualified leads, EQLs, and, right. um, you know, that was, uh, the catalyst for that was a lot of conversations I was having about teams saying, you know, how do we get more out of what we, out of what we already have more out of our current customer population and who's responsible for that process, CS or account management or sales. Um, but another thing I've been noticing is that people are trying to figure out how to, you know, get more out of less than what they already have. Um, and mm -hmm. the way to do that is obviously to, have more focus on how the, the resources you currently have spend their time in the most productive and efficient ways. And part of the conversation that's actually coming occurring in, in some of these calls is that is around the idea of like identifying which prospects should actually be engaged with by the sales team initially, you know, new prospects, not from the current population like EQLs, but just like, how do we identify ICP fit? How do we identify buyer fit? And how do we do that using the data? And it's a really interesting mm -hmm. kind of thought because, you know, you assume that kind of like everybody has predictive lead scoring built into their CRM in some way and um, predictive lead scoring. And this is something that everyone figures out. If you ask anyone, they can tell you what their ICP is. But very, very few people are using data to do it. This is like almost, it really feels a lot like still, you know, my days at HubSpot pre IPO up until, you know, 2014, when marketing would tell us what our personas were. And they would build these persona diagrams of, you know, marketer Mary and owner Ollie and enterprise Aaron. And, Mar you know, marketing Mary was in her late 30s and had a kid and drove a van. And for some teams, that is still kind of how they orient their view of the persona. It is not based in hard data. And by hard data, I mean some actual analysis of the data. So it's really interesting there that probably erroneously, I would, I've kind of viewed this as a solved problem. And the people mm. that I've spoken with recently don't seem to think it is. And they still want to better identify buyer fit or qualify inbound prospects based off ICP or even outbound prospects based off ICP. And they want the data to tell them what that means. And mm -hmm. so I think there is a really, I think there's a really interesting um, kind of like um, osmosis happening here where I almost feel like all these prod, all this movement towards product qualified leads and looking at the actual data of what those people are doing to identify who should be engaged is starting to spill back into kind of the more traditional way we thought about this, which is just ICP fit for prospects or buyer fit for prospects um, and saying, wait, maybe we should look at the data here. And um, right. so, yeah, there's been, I've had a lot of conversations about that. And obviously we have strong opinions about what data matters to things like this uh, and um, why analysis of the data matters. But yeah, this is coming up a lot as this idea of, People are starting to realize that they have a bunch of resources on their team that are expensive and they need to make sure they're getting the, 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 their money's worth. And they're saying, how do we do that? And they're trying to do it all across the business. And that includes in sales teams, how do we focus sales on the right 
on only the conversations that have a high chance of closing based off of a historical analysis of the deals that did close in the past. So a data-driven approach. Yeah, approach yeah, probably it. really what predictive lead scoring should have been based off of an analysis of uh, proven outcomes from, from the past. And so mm -hmm. I really think this starts with an analysis of someone's closed one opportunities. So going back historically to the deals that actually worked and looking at the persona or the kind of characteristics of the yep. company uh, and building your ICP model. Yeah. So I think there's a few that. layers here. The first um, is that there is probably an ICP or buyer fit model for every product line subscription tier that you sell to, that you sell. Um, and you can probably even be more nuanced than that by inbound versus outbound. Okay. Um, so people that buy our flagship product A at this subscription tier and came to us via content, they look like this. And so anyone else that comes in through our content of that size, looking for that product, they need to match this profile for it to be worthy for us to spend our precious resources engaging them. And so, yeah, I mm -hmm. think there's you, you, the way to do this, you look at closed one opportunities and you further focus that in closed one opportunities by product line, probably by subscription tier and product line, so on and so forth. And then mm -hmm. you, and there's probably recency, some recency bias to this as well. Um, so this mm -hmm. is, um, there's an, ex I have an example of this. So one of our customers purchased us to do this and they have a, they had a prior company that was claiming to do this. And when we started mm -hmm. working with them, we're like, how do you feel about your buyer fit model, your buyer fit scores today? And our point of contact's answer was, it was built using data that was so long ago, it's not even relevant. So I know there are right. prospects or leads in my CRM with certain scores that should not have that score. And it is not the fault of, right. the, sys of the provider, it's the fault of the data. Because we are equally weighting really old data uh, uh, against recent data. Um, mm. So I think the way to do this is we say, okay, we have closed one opportunities, maybe within a certain time range, or maybe uh, the time range is specific to each product line and subscription tier within that product line. We do an analysis at the company level first. What conditions do these people have and do these accounts have in common? Um, did uh, employee count, geographic region, um, you know, fundraising, round, all you, you, um, sector, subsector, industry, you know, all the things. Like, let's look at the wide collection of data sets about the account that we can use to reverse engineer some shared profile. Now, the nice thing mm -hmm. is all this firmographic and you know, technographic data is available. And most sales teams have some provider. Like maybe they right. have a Zoom info or something or a Clearbit or a PDL or um, us. Maybe they're using us to do this enrichment. Okay. So I mm -hmm. think that's the, the first step. Now, what's interesting is when you look at the data providers, their match rate typically is pretty low on most data properties. So what do I mean? Yeah, what do I mean by what match rate? I mean, yeah. I have 100 accounts. What percentage of those accounts can my data provider provide that a uh, uh, field for? It's shockingly small for most data providers. Now, it depends on your industry. It depends on the provider. It depends on the property. 
but the reality is it's pre it, it can be pretty sh- shallow you know pretty light coverage mm-hmm. but you know where we can certainly get the data is if the company captures it directly from the prospect So let's say that we have a signal that um, team matters. I mean, mean, you use something basic, like most people would know what team they sell to, but I'll just use something basic for now. Is it more likely that my data provider has extensive coverage for that data property of team? Or is it more likely that I can include it in my onboarding flow or my immediately post account creation flow to capture that data property from the prospect? If I have a trial demo or Mm -hmm. free tier form experience, conversion experience. Um, That way I ensure coverage of the pieces that matter. Right. So I do Mm -hmm. it. I look, I do look at a company data or company enrichment data relative to the closed one opportunities for the products and specific subscription tiers that I care about. When I see Mm -hmm. that a piece of data that seems to be a specific property or condition seems to be really important, if my match rate is not as high as I would like it to be, I should seriously consider adding that to my signup flow or to my demo capture flow or to my request uh, to download an ebook flow. Right. Yeah, and you can use, um, what's it called? Um, Mm -hmm. Progressive profiling that, you know, if you have these fields then ask for different yeah, fields. Yeah, that's right. And um, mm-hmm. this works, that works really well if someone has a target account list already. So these are, here's a hundred accounts right. we know we want to prospect into. Let's create the accounts in the CRM. Let's go ahead and enrich those accounts with the market data that we have from a market data provider, like a Zoom Info or a Apollo or something like that. And then let's, um, when anyone in that account engages in some uh, gated way with us, the fields delivered are specifically the ones designed to fill in the data gaps that we don't have on those records. Right. Then there's the contact level stuff, which is another step, Mm. right? There's company and there's content uh, and there's contact. And Right. It's like, you know, I think in some in some places they kind of differentiate those. There's the ICP, which is company specific. And then there's the quote unquote persona, which is contact specific. And you're looking for this like perfect. If you are feeling strained and need to do more with less. That's the thing. I mean, in a utopian world where resource constraints are not a reality, have as many barriers of entry as you, you know, uh, you allow for as many steps as you want. But in a world in which you are trying to hyper focus your resources because either they have to prove their value or you need to shrink your resources, which I mean, come on, every single day there's a new article about some big tech company laying off a bunch of employees. I mean, didn't Roku just say they were laying off 6% of their employee population or something? I mean, every day someone is laying off I've employees. Lost yeah. Um, and mm-hmm. if in a resource constrained world, we probably want to be as specified as we can be. And so, right. you know, company contact, I would say, uh, on top of, uh, contact that includes what they held, what the hell they did on our site or what they hell they're doing out in the world. So intense stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. But ultimately, all of this data needs to come from the past. And what I mean by that, it needs to come from what uh, from what worked already. And that's this idea of kind of like uh, ICP fit or buyer fit scoring that people are interested in. They want they don't want their marketing teams to tell them the personas. And they don't want to treat uh, ICP fit as like. B2B SaaS companies between 1 and 100 and 300 employees. They want to say for each product line and maybe for specific subscription tiers within those product lines or or even accounts of specific products that eventually upsell to other products or accounts 
of specific products that renew, you can look at the history of closed one opportunities to do that. And you can probably further refine that model by looking at a history of closed lost opportunities alongside of it. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe you create an ICP fit score using a bunch of inputs based off of closed one opportunities, and then you remove the accounts that eventually churned. I mean, do you think people are doing that mm -hmm. today? Do you, uh, I don't know anyone much. that's taking churn into consideration when building out initial buyer fit models or scores. Right. So they are just like, well, it came in the front door. That's a win. And then they don't look back and say, well, yeah. it's actually not a very I mean, good I kind of feel like a lot of people are making scores based off what came in the door. Right. You know, here's, here's what signed up for our free trial. It looks like we do really right, good without with marketing teams. The conversion rate. <laughs> you know? Like, right. that's it. Or we had a bunch of conversations over the last few years before you became an employee at this company. And we are certain that our persona is, you know, marketing mm -hmm. married, 36 year old van driver <laughs> with two kids. I, I most definitely downloaded yeah, that yeah. free collateral yeah. from HubSpot where you fill in the, you know, you fill it in and it has marketing Mary and, and, and Firebot. They, HubSpot believed in that so much that they, the whole marketing and sales teams were designed around it. Sales reps sold to one of those personas that marketing created, marketing Mary, enterprise Aaron, owner Ollie. And if, you know, someone else that wasn't marketing Mary came in, they would... Just ignore it. Uh, Marketing Mary was the bread and butter. That's I mean, that's really who they focused right. on, and all the content. You know, most of the content was for it. And um, the Enterprise Aaron team never talked to the Marketing Mary team. But I mean, when I like three personas at that level of um, lack of granularity. It, listen, at least when I was there, we were talking, you know, 2014, but. And HubSpot has always kind of been um, first in class, but I don't think many companies from what I'm seeing have moved beyond that. And now I think they're feeling right. the pain because of how constrained the market is and how much pressure they're feeling to make their resources go as far as they can. And so, yeah, I think this... Uh, I think, you know, in our last call, we were super jazzed about this idea of um, expansion qualified leads as being the future EQLs. And I do think that's the case, but it kind of feels like the past is coming back to the present and people are saying, what the, f mm -hmm. what is my ICP? And I don't right. want to hear your opinion on it. I want the data to tell me what it is. And the only way right. to do that is to analyze the data. And what you're really trying to analyze is the outcomes that have that have been the outcomes you care about that have occurred in some past, whether that's all time or recent or whatever, and then reverse engineering what was common amongst the ones that achieved those outcomes. And it's more than just they bought. It could be they bought this product and renewed. Right. And so is, you know, taking this data driven approach to ICP, is it a binary thing where it's like ICP or not? Or is it more of a score where there's it's a score. levels of it? Uh, and that score is uh, probably a range of, listen, it's all, I'm not a fan of like one to 100 scales. Like uh, right. if you're a movie critic, all right. You can, you can be a movie critic that says, watch it, don't watch it. Or you can be a movie critic right. like, um, was it Siskel and Ebert? Is one thumbs up, two thumbs up, or no thumbs up? All right, we got a three-point Likert scale. Uh, or you could be a reviewer that reviews things on a one to 10 scale. Okay, 10-point 10, 10 mm -hmm. Likert scale. I've seen a lot of these predictive scoring and a lot of the old health scoring systems, they're like, this person's a 71. It, the right, level of nuance mean? is just not necessary. It doesn't. And in fact, I think it makes things more confusing for the individual contributor on the front line responsible for driving the outcome with that data. And so 
I do think there is probably a level of an amount of granularity, which is good, but too much, um, too much granularity is bad. So what I mean by that is you can probably qualify someone's level of ICP fit or buyer fit in a few inputs, three, five point Likert scales. If you want to go crazy, maybe seven, but do we really need more than high, medium, low, or great, good, fine, bad, awful? Like, do you really need more than a three or five point Likert scale for this? Probably not. But what you do want is the really, really rich context for why someone has that value. And not just the good, the positive conditions they have is true for why they have that value, but also the ones they're missing that would get them to the next value. And so what that would allow Mm. someone to do is say, I have completely different engagement strategies or nurturing strategies for each of those values. If someone is Mm -hmm. great, let's say on a five point Likert scale, they're the top value. A salesperson should call them within four minutes, (laughs) like pick up the phone and call them. If they come in and they're good, probably should still call them. If they're fine, maybe we engage them with a, with a marketing email email. And what the point of that is to try and qualify the missing data fields that would allow us to understand if they should go higher or lower. But if they're bad or not great, mm-hmm. you know, maybe we shouldn't, this should not be a manual thing. Maybe we should send them our marketing newsletter. Maybe we should do like so on and so forth. Is it so kind of in a best practice a situation, does it make sense to have these disparate scores that people look at, or should it really be this kind of singular score that takes all of that into account? And maybe the sales rep or whomever can then kind of drill in and see what is it that's um, making up this score? Like, how do they fit in the ICP? How do they fit? On yeah, the yeah. Side? I think there's a real great is the enemy a good thing here. Um, Mm -hmm. What's the best diet? The best diet is the one you'll stick to. What's the best workout regime? CrossFit, HIIT, bodybuilder, bro split, whatever. Uh, The best workout routine is the one you'll stick with. I kind of feel like it's the same thing here. Um, How much much data, how many insights is right? Well, the more the merrier until there's so much that a non-technical individual contributor on the front lines can't understand it well enough to drive an outcome based off of it. And so in general, I think there's probably a proper balance between the more the merrier and less is more. So there's probably a a singular high level summary number with really rich context for why that summary. Because when a a CS rep could be responsible for a few dozen or a few hundred accounts, they can't be responsible for looking at 50 fields for each account to make a decision. We we don't have the time. A a sales rep is probably the same. Like a sales rep trying to pick up the the phone and call. I mean, if you're ClickUp and you're generating who knows how many thousands of inbounds every day, like you don't have time to look at every one of those contact or uh, account records in your CRM to understand what you need to ping, right? So we need to make that as quick as possible. Looking at one field is a nice way to do that. One property, one object, okay? Boom, they're high fit. Anything beyond that, they're high fit is only to help me have a better conversation. Okay. Right. Why? They have a high fit. They're going on my list. I'm going to call them. I've got a Salesforce report set up that anyone with high fit automatically gets pulled over into it. And a tenth of those get assigned to me. And I'm going to pick up the phone and call them. I am only, I'm going to talk to them based off of the context for why they have that score. And so I think... Mm-hmm. I think less is I think less is more here at the top level and I think more the merrier once you dig into why that score. 
Right. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, I think there's this problem where it's like, yeah, we don't have, an, there's a problem of not having enough data, but there's always the problem of having too much, which are, I think, equally bad because it's, if you have too much, you might as well have none because you can't really make analysis paralysis. Like, okay, right. I got, I have 400. I mean, we just integrate, we just onboarded a, a customer last week that had like 400 contact fields. They're actually yeah. the same one I'm talking about. It said their old ICP fit model score was, it was useless. Um, four, I mean, 400 contact fields. How is a rep? dealing with those. I think it's kind of, it's kind of like uh laws right it's very it's easy to make laws it's it's very easy, very difficult yeah. to get rid of them like once they're there right the same thing with, with fields in CRM it's, it's very hard to get somebody to delete that field um it just makes sense you just want you end up just leaving it there because you don't yeah, want the to, yeah the uh, the yeah. uh I my sister is a collector of things and I always used to joke like the only difference between my sister and a hoarder is square footage uh, in a in a smaller right. house, she would be on hoarders. In a in the house she lives in, right. she's a collector. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, it's kind of the same thing, you know. In these um, infinitely extensible CRMs, uh, it's pretty it's pretty easy to get bloat to the point that all of that yeah. noise makes the individual contributor's job harder. There's this. Um, there is an erroneous belief that data accessibility drives outcomes. You and I, you've heard me talk about this a bunch. We may have even talked about this in prior conversations. That if that all I need to do is make this team's data accessible to this team, and boom, problem solved. And that is just not true. Right. Data accessibility no, just alone problem. does not drive an outcome. You can move data around all you want, and you can take every piece of table-based data and put it in a pretty graph. And that is not going to help someone close a deal or it's not going to ensure someone close a de- closes a deal. It's not going to help them guarantee renewal. It's not going to get expansion revenue. It's not going to drive adoption or sentiment. Data accessibility is not the answer. It's an individual contributor's ability to understand and do something about that data that drives an outcome. And so right. smashing a CRM full of all this data is probably right. counter-effective. <laughs> it's probably uh, better to put very little data in there and instead summarize the point of that data so that person can go do their job. Right. I think there's this mission creep that happens where it's like, we need more, you know, and maybe that decision comes from above from someone who's not really interacting with it on a daily basis. They're just like, we need this data. But when you know when when you're in the heat of the the battle, uh, having to analyze you know a thousand fields to come up with some sort of idea of what I'm looking at, it, makes, it, it, listen, very it makes sense that people have think this is valuable, and it makes sense why people still do this. Okay, right? So, I mean, think how many pieces of software are out there. There are hundreds of systems designed to do something with customer data. I mean, basically every piece of enterprise SaaS. Is designed to do something with customer data. It's you're capturing it, you're storing it, you're moving it around, you're visualizing it, you're doing something with it. Okay. And um, that again, bloat, we're like, hey, can we get this stuff centralized? We want a source of record. We want a 360 view of our customers. We want, uh, I need product usage in my CRM, so on and so forth. Like, I just need this shit here. Okay. So there's this. For good, like for good reason, people were like, "Can we get wrangle all this in?" And then we're like, "Hey, um, sales ops, hey rev ops, hey data team, hey uh, engineering team, like we we need this data here." And every field that they successfully connect from that to that is a little win. They did their job. Look at what I just accomplished and did. It's like a a false sense of progress, a fake dopamine hit. I did it. Right. And then Sally, the salesperson, has just had another. Yeah. Field oh my god. Really and then, well, anymore. Sally, the salesperson, says, "Sweet, I now have usage." And then she's like, "What is all this table-based event data from Pendo? What am I supposed to right. do with that? Is one login good or is four good? Over how much <laughs> time? Okay, I see that they 
did right. this exported data. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Someone told me that's probably a bad thing. You know, it's just like this, the data overload is not the solution to helping focus our resources. Right. So it's it, it kind of tying things up. It seems like the, you know, people want data, but they don't necessarily think about, you know, the value of that data or how it can be, you know, what it, how the context to the person that's actually using it, how they're going to get context. People want outcomes. It. Um, that's what people want. Right. People want outcomes. Right. And, and they think, well, well, we just need this. And That'll they help us think this that outcome, those outcomes are hidden in data that exists, but isn't accessible. And so right. they decide to make it accessible. They do that by either moving it to the tool where that team that needs it lives or moving it to another tool where they can go. And typically the other tool is a, mm. is a visualization tool for graphs and charts and stuff. Okay. Um, right. But they're not taking the next step in realizing, I mean, I would love for people to do a uh, before and after analysis of this before we put that data into those fields in the CRM or before we built that Tableau report, did, did we close fewer deals? Did our close rate change at all? by putting that data there or visualizing that data in this graph? Did anything change from an outcome perspective? Because if it didn't, it was wasted work. And in fact, it may actually be detrimental. There's certainly an opportunity cost for it. Every time a data team is working to make one team's data accessible to another team, they're not doing something critical about understanding the data they have and what that may mean for the future of the business. So instead of like just mm -hmm. piling on more and more and more data, we should probably be focused on how do we give the frontline people responsible for those outcomes, which is what we ultimately care about, only the data understanding that they need to do that job. That's really what any of these outcome focused scores, which we've talked about before, are about identifying expansion qualified leads. What the hell does that mean? It's identifying which customers are ready for an expansion outcome based off of a deep understanding of all of the data. An ICP fit or a buyer fit score. What the hell do we mean by that? It's an analysis of which prospects or leads are, are likely to close uh, based off what has happened in the past so that we can focus our limited resources on the most on the lowest hanging fruit right and um and it feels like we're at this kind of interesting inflection moment where even the problems that felt solved i know who my persona right. is we're 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 uh taking another glance at and saying maybe that isn't the case maybe i should actually Look at the data and understand for the outcomes that I care about, what do the people that achieve those outcomes have in common? And it's more granular than one ICP fit score to rule, rule them all. It's for every product line, probably for every subscription tier, probably for uh, multi multivariate outcomes after the initial close one opportunity, renewal, expansion, gave you a fucking testimonial like something but right, right. you know it's it, it's better it's bigger be better than marketing mary you know there's something right. more here and i think teams are starting to feel like that there's enough conversation about ai going on right now that people are saying can i point this concept at data to even yeah. challenge my originally preconceived notions that I was certain were true. Yeah, I do. I do think that the whole AI bonanza is getting people to rethink what's possible and, you know, um, rethink what, you know, they thought was solved based on just kind of yeah. their own insights. Um, and I, I, I suspect it'll, you know, we're, we're talking about ICP today, but we may be talking about other kind of, fundamental things in the sales and marketing world that we all kind of just assumed were 
um, you know, canon, uh, will be will be I mean, up for I, discussion. Yeah, th- think about soon. this. You know, we've raised two rounds of funding. When we raised our pre-seed mm-hmm. round of funding, VCs asked me what our ICP was. <laughs> think how f- insane that is. Actually, like, I, and I didn't think it was weird at the time. I didn't think it was weird until right. relatively recently. Well, it's part of the, it's the same thing oh, as the total so addressable market sliding, right? Where you're just like, it's yeah. 7 trillion so, because so there are that many. So dumb. Uh, yeah, that's the, uh, <laughs> the VCs that don't know what they're looking at are asking for TAM. Right. Uh, no, the, uh, yeah, I mean, asking, uh, asking a company what their ICP fit is based off no data benchmarks is almost comical. Right. Now, it's okay to say, who, do you, who are you intending to try and sell to first? What's your beachhead market? Like that's different. But asking someone what their ICP fit is, even when they're a seed stage company with a few dozen customers, it's still too early. But the fact right. that that's what that that is emblematic of some broader philosophy around ICP, which in, in you know in my reading of it implies that it ain't based in the data, because mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. a company that early stage don't have enough data to extrapolate, and so mm-hmm. yeah, I uh, there is there's a bunch of companies trying to figure out you know how. We, they shift from this more at all costs to more from what I already have, or in some case, more from less than what I currently have. And that is leading to this, um, this personal audit, you know, or greater intellectual rigor around the way they've been doing things. I mean, in the past 24 hours, mm-hmm. I've had two companies email me saying, hey, we're looking at our, all of our tool spend and we have these tools is it possible for us to cancel those subscriptions and just move them over more of that functionality over to you guys? It's like, there's an audit going around yeah. everywhere. And yes, um, for sure. I think yeah. Good. That uh, yeah. part of that audit is just not like what exists, but uh, um, my uh, let, let's audit our own beliefs about the world. And one of those core, you know, tenants of belief at most companies is what your ICP is. And if that ain't based in data, then you're just guessing. And even if it's based in data, it's a temporary estimate based off what I, what I had access to, but it's still way better than a marketing brainstorm and a hackathon on a Friday. Yeah. I, uh, I think that's a good place to, uh, to put a pin in it for this week. Um, but I suspect that many of our conversations will be kind of talking about the um, reassessing our <laughs> beliefs that we yeah, thought were in a, uh, in, a uh, in a post SVB world. And I don't even know if it's going to be SVB, but I guess it occurred. So everything is post SVB. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's super interesting just to see how people are are reevaluating what matters. Uh, and uh, making decisions about the future without just assuming, continuing the status quo. So, yeah, if I hear more cool stuff about this, I'll mention it uh, in future future conversations. Mm-hmm.